The thing about depression is you can be depressed and not even realize it or understand why. Depression presents differently in everyone. But if you don't understand why you're depressed, it can be that much more difficult for people around you to see it or help. Former Washington State quarterback Tyler Holinsky always had a smile on his face. He wanted everyone around him to be happy. But two years ago, at 21 years old, he died by suicide. His parents, Mark and Kim Holinsky, joined me on this week's Mental Health Time Out. Kim and Mark, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. So many people right now are spending more time than they've ever spent with their families, including their children. By all accounts, it seems like you two have really made it a point to be very in involved in your children's lives, even after high school. Still, you found yourselves in a situation that parents should never ever have to find themselves in and you lost one of your three children. On top of that, your son Tyler died by suicide, which is never easy to process when someone dies by suicide, but you know, especially at such a, such a young age, it's you know, awful. Yes. I know you have previously mentioned um, that Tyler's behavior started to change a little bit about three months before his death. There was an Arizona game, he was put in late in the second quarter. He played the entire second half. And, but I think for people, just so they understand, what was Tyler like for most of his life? And then how would you describe the changes in his behavior? And, and what did they really look like? Um, I'll, I'll answer the first part of the question. We can give the second part to Mark. Um, he was a sweetheart out of all our three sons and they're both wonderful and loving and good, but he just had this sweet quality, uh, very caring, right? Loved everybody in his life. And because he had that, so many people loved him too. He was fun. He was funny. Um, he loved being with his family and he had a really good group of friends too. Um, so Handsome, you know, athletic, um, loved by his brothers. They were each other's best friends. And to think that, that Tyler, who seemingly had it all, um, you know, passed by suicide, it, it, like you said, it's still, we still process it and, and don't understand. And, and every day we, we, we look for the why. And, and it, changes, yeah. Yeah. No, and then, yeah, did Mark, did you want to talk about just like the changes that you guys did see? Yeah, it's, um, so as Kim sort of points out, Tyler was real easy to get along with. So you you talk to him by text or by phone or FaceTime and, you know, a McDonald's drive through, which I never understood. Um, and so Tyler, like like a lot of kids, he was really responsive. So Hey, how you doing? How was your test today? How was practice? What's the guy, what are the guys doing? You know, that kind of stuff. You'd always sort of get these very quick, sometimes short, sometimes long, sometimes a phone call, but they were, they were pretty routine. You know, they were, they, you'd send a question, he'd send an answer or he'd call you if he missed you. And I, and I always used to love to see Tyler's, you know, um, not an emoji, but a missed call from Tyler, you know, if I was in a meeting at work or something, because I couldn't wait to get back and call him. So I was at the game, the Arizona game, um, and you're right, he came in in the middle, well, at the last drive of the second quarter, when we scored and we went back, um, and, and it was really, it was a crazy game. He, he threw for over 500 yards um, in a half, which was like, you know, second on this list he'd, he'd performed so well but they lost and i saw him after the game after the interviews and stuff and in sort of where the parents gather and the kids gather and what was what struck me was how little interaction there was between all the families you know normally we're all, and and you law you know a loss is is tough but this was just more particularly um it was different from other losses that we'd been, you know, we'd been with Tyler on the fact that he played a lot in the game probably had something to do with it. But, um, probably from then through the bowl game, which was in December, 
those text messages, we got a lot of, hey, I overslept, or, um, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't have my phone with me. And that wasn't unusual. Tyler wasn't always tied to his phone. But at the time, it just felt like he was getting more distant, you know. And remember at that same time as it got sort of more pronounced in December, and I called him on it and said, hey, you know, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, you know. And he was really good at convincing you everything was okay. Not in a million years did we think anything was wrong. I mean, he was, he was now going to be the starter in the bowl game, so he was busy with a lot of football stuff. He was moving or was supposed to be moving up at school. Um, classes were wrapping up, right? The New Year's, you know, seeing friends and all that. But looking back on it, there definitely was a change in how he responded. And people ask all the time, what would you recommend? Or what would, you know, like we know anything, right? We're in a, just a the terrible position like a lot of families, but I would be much, knowing what I know now, not just about Tyler, but about mental illness and mental health and mental wellness that we keep talking about, um, I would have followed my gut and and been more demanding of, of finding out what was going on. And it felt like helicopter parents, you know, he's 21, give him a, a little bit of space and breathing room. But that's the only thing I could think of now. But at the time, you know, it's hard because you feel guilty that you missed something and you couldn't see it. But, you know, Kim and I have been over this a thousand times. Any one of those things, if you said it, would you go up and fly up to Pullman and take him to a counselor and demand? No, they weren't. None of those things individually or even added up to was I worried about his safety at all. I was, I felt for him, you know, I, I, I want all my guys to be happy, but, um, I felt for him, but not, I wasn't worried about him. So that was wrong. So I think, you know, looking back, I would, I would change that, but that, that in a nutshell, the conversations got fewer, they got less detailed and they were spread out farther. So it was just a change in pattern of behavior. So in, in a lot of the Holinsky Hope Talks and some of the trainers that we have coming up, uh, come out with us, one of them is a training session on how to teach your teammates and your roommates and your friends at school how to spot some of those signs. And again, not that you're looking for somebody that's suicidal, but somebody that might be at the edges of controlling their own mental wellness, you know. And I think that's the biggest difference I can share about how Tyler changed yeah. And I think it's also really important to know, you know, for me, when you say like a suicidal person, you know, with my suicide attempt, I wasn't a suicidal person. I had never had suicidal ideations. I yeah. was a happy person. I was someone that had a smile on my face. I felt like it was my job to be a leader for the people around me. And so I felt like it was important for me to keep that smile on my face. And even for me, you guys say you struggle kind of with the why. Um, I struggled with the how when I woke up in the hospital, I was like, how did I end up here? How is this my life, my journey? I'm too smart. I'm too tough. I'm, this isn't, this isn't like, it, it was difficult to process mm -hmm. for you guys with the, the why, you know, I think a lot of people right now, they have these questions too, during this time, there's so much uncertainty. They can't answer questions of when they'll go back to work or when the where their next meal may be coming from for their kids a lot of people are in some really difficult situations but you guys have been in a really difficult situation as well uh -oh. sorry that's ryan <laughs> you're good you're good what have you done to make sure in terms of the why i know like you said the why of like, why didn't he talk to you? Why didn't he talk to someone? Have you guys reached a point of understanding that those are some questions that you may never get answers to? And if so, what was like that process like of you of just saying, we have to understand and accept that there are things that we may never know or understand? Because again, if you, if you don't go through that process or haven't, or at some point, it can also be detrimental 
to your mental health, to your son's mental health, Kelly and Ryan. Yeah. So, I mean, I've said for the past year or so that, that I'm stopping looking for the why. Um, and I think I lie really when I say that because it's, it's always in my head. Why did he leave us? Why didn't he talk to us? Why couldn't he reach out and ask for help? Um, but if you keep doing that, that same process every single day and multiple times a day, you're right. It does affect your own mental health. And, um, like you said, you always had a smile on your face. You always were there for everyone. You were the leader. Todd was a lot of that too. And to think that this happy kid with that laugh for everyone um, took his own life, it just, you really can't figure out the why. But what we have come to believe is that he was sick, right? He had an illness, just like cancer. My dad died from cancer, just like ALS. My mom passed from ALS. You know, it's, um, it's an illness just like those. And sadly, we couldn't save him. I mean, we tried. We, we went through everything that you could get your hands on. So his iPad, his, his, um, his notebook, and we couldn't find his phone when we went to clean out his apartment. And we didn't find it for like six, seven months. And when we did find it, we were hoping there'd be more information that would help us understand what happened and why it happened. Um, number one. Number two, by the time we found it and were able to unlock it, um, it was... It, it can't, we were looking for things that could help other people too. So, oh, you know, if, if he were searching these terms or if he was looking this stuff up and, you know, I can spare you the technical piece of it, but we got everything on his phone, every deleted Snapchat, every single thing from a company. There's only two in the world that can break Apple iPhones anymore. So the sad part about it, well, there's a, it's all sad, but um, in order to do that, they have to redo your, um, they have to understand and figure out what your password is. And so Tyler, like a lot of kids, his password was one, two, three, four, five, or, or what, you know, all, all three, something. And um, his brother knew it, his girlfriend knew it, we knew it, and none of those worked. And so when they broke the phone, they gave us the password that, that opened the phone. Right, so they run a bunch of algorithms and they come up with the, and then they finally, when they sent us back the phone, they put a little sticky note on it with his password. And the password made no, I mean, the numbers didn't make any sense to us. Like, they're just random. But he had changed it just shortly before he died. And I forget, it, and it probably doesn't matter how it came to be, but the only word that works for that is the word sorry. And I can't, so here we are looking for notes. We're looking for search terms. We're looking for websites. He didn't look up depression. He didn't look up anxiety. He didn't look up suicide. He looked up how to load an AR-15 two hours before he died, how to clean it, how to position it without hurting somebody else nearby, and how to make sure it worked. I mean, those that's what we got out of looking for why was – the very last minutes of what he listened to, what he watched. And, and it's not helpful because it doesn't explain the things that most parents or, or friends of, of survivors, friends of obviously of people that didn't, um, why they did that and why they, and you know, Kim said why he couldn't have asked for help. We're, we're out telling everybody to go ask for help if you need it. Right. And we're trying to knock down the stigma, bring awareness, us and a lot, you and a lot of us are trying to do that. And I have to say, um, there, there's something else, and, and we, there's no research behind this. Ross Zabo, who does our Behind Happy Faces, he wrote that book, he did a great TED Talk, and um, he and I have talked many times about that suicide may be its own disease. Yes, it can be um, fueled by anxiety or it can be fueled by clinical depression. And there's those links are clear, 
But when you're 21 and you don't have those things, at least pub, it's very hard as a quarterback on a football, you know, at a football team in a school, you don't have a lot of places to hide. And you're, as you, you know, you can understand as a former athlete, all it, it's going to come out. And so when we went back up and talked to his team and his coaches and his friends and everybody's kind, you know, they understand how difficult it, but none of them, not one was anything but flabbergasted, you know, just completely lost for words. And so we kept poking to find, well, how, and Kim and I know, and, and the, the brother, his brothers know things are different when you're in the family, you know, you can sort of let your hair down and, be yourself and you don't get criticized for it as much, but there was definitely something between October and January 16th that he was struggling with. And in his case, he just came across the unfortunate opportunity to go out and shoot guns that he's never, he's never fired a firearm in his life, never held a loaded weapon, goes out and does, you know, some skeet shooting with the guys somehow manages to steal an AR-15 out of the bag, grab ammunition, and hide it for three days from the, from the rest of the world. Now, if again, this is all hindsight. If, if they call the police that day and say, we're missing this very important, deadly weapon, um, maybe they shake Tyler's place down and find it. Maybe they, you know, they push in... And I'm not, I'm not even blaming anybody, I, the, but when we talk about this stuff, if you look at the research for males under 25 that died by gunshot, the ones that where the, where the weapon didn't work or they changed their mind or whatever, the, the research says they don't go out and jump off a bridge and they don't try to take their lives a different way. And so in our very specific little, you know, in the, scheme of things, little case, Tyler's alive if he doesn't go out there, you know, at least for some period of time, maybe that his breakdown mentally would be more obvious after that. He accidentally fired the thing through, through his door and his, his car. Um, I don't know how you can't hear in, in his apartment complex, a gunshot that loud. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's, it's up there. So unfortunately, none of that happened. And Tyler, Tyler, for whatever reason, couldn't talk about it. He, his roommate, his, mo his roommate, his mom died by can from cancer when he was five. He's been seeing a counselor on and off ever since. He didn't have a car. Tyler drove him to the counselors every other Friday, got pizza, sat and talked about it. So he knew people would get help for things they were struggling with. But I, I have the sense that Tyler viewed that as real. You know, oh, my mom died, therefore I'm, I, I can be sad and sick. Tyler was sad and sick and he didn't have, his parents are still here, you know what I mean? So I know that's going on and on, but that, that's just some of the stuff that I think we deal with every day in terms of asking why and how come. Well, I think we can feel like our what we're struggling with isn't valid or that we don't have room to be this sad or this depressed. It doesn't make that much sense because there are people that have it so much worse. And I think for me, that was part of it. I was in an abusive marriage, but I was like, I put myself in this situation. I should have gotten out before this. So it's on me to figure this out. And so for me as someone who throughout my life had little things or things here or there that, you know, I didn't even realize until after and you go to therapy and you figure it out that, you know, man, I experienced all of these, these hard things and I didn't deal with any of them. I just threw myself into volleyball or I threw myself into my career. Or I threw myself into something else and I put a smile on my face and I laughed and I did other things. I think, you know, a big part of being a quarterback is being able to develop trust within your team, being able to lead. And I think that can put a lot of pressure sometimes on people to feel like they always have to be strong or they can't be vulnerable. Because just like you said about Tyler, he was taking his friend, his teammate to a therapist. I had a friend, my, the, my closest friend in the world at the time, she, was, she fought for our country, she was deployed. 
And she came back and she struggled. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you need to talk to someone. You need to do this. You need to, you need to really go and talk. And when she started to go, I was like, you need to be honest with them. You can't just go and sit in front of them and talk about things that aren't relevant. You need to talk about the real stuff to, to be able to work through this. And I was able to do all of that. And, you know, she was very frustrated with me after because she was like, I went through all of this and you helped me so much. And I'm on FaceTime with you and your husband and you're smiling and you're like, it's all good, even though you know it's not. And so, you know, I, I worked with people in my life through that of like, like, why could you be so willing and, and easy to tell other people, get help, it's okay, it doesn't make you less than, you went through something. But again, like you said, she fought for our country. I thought, that's, yeah. that's heroic. Like, you did something great. I didn't, it, you know, in my mind. So I think when you look at someone in a position where they're a quarterback and they feel all of this, this pressure that they have to save face, that, you know, my job is to be the shoulder for people to lean on and not somebody that's, that's, you know, a little bit shaky because even though that's human, I think we see it as, man, I see myself as less than so other people may. And I, you know, but you guys have raised, you guys raised three quarterbacks. Yeah. Ryan right now is South Carolina's starting quarterback. Is there anything that you have done or said to him to make sure that he is, it's very clear to him that, it is okay not to be okay. It doesn't make you less of a leader. It doesn't make you less of a man. It doesn't matter if it's a school thing or a football thing. There's nothing too small or too trivial that you can't talk to us about and let us know that you are really struggling. Yeah, we've, we've had those conversations every day since Tyler passed. Um, and once we, I mean, we moved across the country from California to South Carolina to be close to him. It was just impossible to be apart from each other. So we do have those conversations. We check in all the time, you know, especially right now during this physical distancing, you know, COVID-19. I worry about how he's doing, you know, how not being with his teammates and his coaches, right? How it's affecting his mental health. So it's we talk really well when we're going on walks or when we're driving together and he, he seems to open up and you know he says he does feel uncertain because he doesn't know what tomorrow is going to bring and each day is just a replay of the day before but he does talk about it and he actually reaches out to other people to make sure that they're talking about their mental health it's really important to him because you know, a tragedy stuck, struck our family and we have a hard time moving forward and taking steps each day, but, you know, helping Ryan, helping other student athletes, you know, deal with their struggles, um, that helps us too. And I think continuing the conversations with Ryan, with Kelly, us, right and and everyone out there it's just so important to us and it it helps us too i think um the other thing is once we started holinsky's hope um they both know what we're doing they hear it they see it they support it they're with us sometimes but you know by example we're out there talking about tyler about their brother about what happened um you know he, a big fat guy crying in front of thousands of people. You can't get any more. Um, you can't give a different example. Like you were saying, which I thought was such a good point. You act one way, even inside you're, you're feeling differently. Well, we're trying to be as transparent as possible about this stuff. It's not a show, right? But you can't, you can't talk about your son that's passed for 60 minutes without being emotional. So I think that part of it, the second part, which I know is different for every family, and this is not like, we're not better or worse for it, but we talk about Tyler all the time. Not, not incessantly where it wears you out, but if there's a picture or if there's a sunset or if there, whatever that may be relatable to something we did with Ty Tyler, we just immediately talked about it openly. And I think the kids after a couple of years of being able to do that, it's not treatment, it's not, you know, but I think the response is, 
they feel more comfortable with what, not comfortable, they feel more able to process and to talk about it and not feel like it has to be bottled up and, and shunned. And so I think that expression of being able to do that probably lets off at least some of the steam. And Kim's right, we talked to him a lot about all this, but remember, they also know that we probably think, and they know we're worried about them all the time. And so that puts added pressure. You know, if you ask the second, third, are you okay? How you? Yes, I'm okay. You know, it goes without being said. But I mean, Tyler said yes, too. And, and they know that, too. So it's this endless cycle of having those conversations, checking in, validating those, right? So the same way, are they responding the same, eating the same, sleeping the same, to the degree you, you can know all that stuff. But um, I think... I think that probably has helped as much as anything, to be honest. Absolutely. I, you know, I think a lot of people right now are struggling so much because it's uncomfortable. And when you're uncomfortable, yeah. different emotions and feelings, and you don't have the distractions, you know, football in a lot of ways can be a distraction. You know, a job can be a distraction, even going to the gym or that drive home from dropping the kids off. Those things, they take away your time to just sit and think and be with your thoughts. And, and again, if those thoughts aren't positive, they can consume you. You know, during this time though, I know, or I don't even think it's just during this time, I've heard you say, Kim, that you spend a lot of your time answering emails and handwritten letters of people that have heard your family's journey and have been impacted by it, or maybe it's changed something in their life. You know, with all of these, and I know for me and the stories that I've heard or the coaches or, or the people that have come to me and shared their stories, they, that's what they do. They, they thank me for sharing my story, but then they also share a piece of themselves with me where they have this thing where they're like, man, I didn't ever, I've never talked to anyone about this because I didn't, I didn't know how to, I didn't, I didn't, maybe I didn't feel like it was valid for you in reading the letters and the emails. Have there been biggest, like a biggest takeaway or commonalities that you've seen in a lot of these stories? Because I think so often people are struggling with a lot of these same things and they don't talk about it. And so we don't realize how common some of these struggles are. Yeah, you're right. They're very common. And, and I commend you for your strength and your courage to, to share your story because you doing that is helping so many people. And I'm, I know you get, you get the stories and the emails too, but there's others out there that probably haven't reached out to you that your story has impacted them and given them strength to maybe speak up and ask for help. Um, the emails that we get, you know, the, the letters, a common thread in most of them, most of them is grateful you know, that we shared our story like you did yours. Um, and a lot of them say, you know, I see Tyler in me or I see Tyler in my son or my nephew um, or my niece, um, you know, good, happy, fun, but they're struggling with anxiety and something's not just right. So those emails help us so much writing my thank you notes. I get to write Tyler's name two or three times in those thank you notes and it, and it keeps him right here. I mean, he always is, but um, I, I get to just, you know, share stories about him and, and it keeps him alive. Um, Kelly, our oldest son um, has on his, I think it's Twitter wallpaper, a quote that he put on there before Tyler died, but it's so profound um, to what we're doing. And it says, they say you die twice, once when you take your last breath and the second time when someone says your name for the last time. And Kelly says, I'm, I'm not going to let my brother die twice. And so that's why we're sharing Tyler's story is that we're keeping his memory alive and we're trying to honor that, that sweet soul um, by helping others. I think a lot of times the problem is, and even for me, I didn't understand mental health. I always, in sports, you talk about mental toughness. You talk about, you know, I feel like I can't do another rep, but like push through, do yeah. a few more because that makes you tough. That makes you um, a better a competitor. Yeah. But we don't talk about, I feel like mental health enough in the sports world. So, yeah. so often when people think about mental health, they think, 
there are these people that are just sick and then there are these people that are healthy mm-hmm. and you know people can appear very healthy or people can be healthy but no one i feel like is immune so someone who is healthy or appears healthy can become sick if they have stress or they have trauma and they don't process it and they don't talk about it and they don't work through it tyler had cte which is caused by repeated trauma to his head over a period of time and then on top of that he he was a college student he was an athlete he was a quarterback which those are all high stress situations and so individually you may not think oh that's that's you know something that's huge but when you put it all together it can it can be overwhelming if you keep it all inside and you don't talk about the little things what is the biggest thing that you want people to take away and, and these student athletes to take away from the message from your family's journey and from the work you do with Helensky's Hope? You know, I, I'll have Mark touch on, we went out to see the UCLA football team and I watched, it was filmed and I watched it afterwards. And Mark, you talked about um, mental toughness um, and the difference between that and you know, not being well mentally. And I thought it was so true, right? I mean, we, what, um, what I think it's important, if you, if to be authentic, what we've learned from the student athletes themselves, they're not gonna ask for help for anything if their coaches don't feel um, that they're on the same page, if they don't feel that their coaching staff will support them. And so we can go out and tell them what to do and give them training and, and, so forth but um so as part of that to to sort of get everybody's attention in those meetings we talk about the differences and and ross does a a much better job um sort of explaining you know we all get sad when we lose a football game or a volleyball game or score poorly on a test or whatever we get anxious when we know we have a game the next day or we have a date tonight or something but clinically uh depressed is very different and you have to accept that as you just said we're all susceptible to that and it's not very easy you can't do a blood test there there's we're getting there there's technology right that you know hopefully in 20 years we'll be able to do a better job um but you're exactly right and so what we what we try to tell the kids is you still can be mentally tough you have to to play these games at this level yeah. we're not excuse oh, I don't feel like getting up today, it is, it's a problem when it becomes a clinical de- depression or anxiety and needs treatment. And it's very difficult, and we're not the mental health experts to explain the, the individual details, but we don't tell them that this is, um, this is anything but very serious. And so you'll hear, we don't use the word committed suicide anymore because it, for a lot of reasons, and there's, you know, it, it, it's applicable in some, most of them is they, they got a disease, you have a disease, Tyler had a disease, maybe multiple disease processes going on at once, and nobody in the right mind takes their life as an answer to, oh my God, I'm so tired, or I'm, I'm overwhelmed with work. Something else is going on in, in CTE, depression, anxiety at that level. Um, those need people that have those disease processes need help period it's just like a torn ACL or broken ankle you got to get fixed and you've got to you've got to identify that you're not feeling the same and that's part of what we're trying to do is explain to people um, that it's okay to get help for this COVID has done nothing but sort of exacerbate the entire thing you're out of your comfort zone you don't have your um, your, your locker room, you don't have the training facilities, you don't have your school classes, believe it or not, um, is part of their routine and they look forward to those different things, however much they complain. But that mental toughness to get through the day, that's still a requirement, right? Nobody gets excused from having to do their sport and play it well. But if you're sick, you need to get help and treatment and you can prosper and, and do well and in life and um, don't be afraid of it. Just manage it like you manage anything else. And if we can tell enough people and their surrounding support cast, coaches, ADs, um, boosters, if we can change that conversation a little bit so kids 
that feel that re they really need help can get it, um, and then have the resources available on campus uh, for them, then I think we've, we've made a dent. Absolutely. No, thank you guys so much for the work you're doing. I, I wish I had it when I was in college. I, I think it's just, you don't know what you don't know. And I know that's an overused saying, but it's, it's so true that if you don't understand something, um, and that goes from coaches down, because I think a lot of the culture is created in sports, especially through just a failure to understand that mental health is real. That's sure right. Is. And so, no, I just appreciate you guys. I think you're incredible for taking Tyler's life and continuing it. I, I like the, the quote from, from Kelly's, I think you said Twitter wallpaper of just, you know, keeping him alive through continuing to share his story, share his name. And, and, you know, the good, the bad, everything that, that he was. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. So well, right. thank you much for thank having you. us. But I, I have one last uh, ask. So as you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, right? And we are relaunching what we call the three for three burpee challenge. It's to get up for those who are down. It actually originated in Pullman by WSU students in a sports management class. So we kicked off the month of May with the relaunch of the three for three burpee challenge. You do three burpees or you say why mental health matters to you and then you challenge three friends to do the same. So you are gonna be challenged to do three burpees. Okay, okay. I, accept. <laughs> I accept. Okay. And do I need to challenge the people right now on the spot? I'm trying to think. Oh no, no you, you do, do it. it whatever you do. Okay, yeah. I will, I will though, I will think of three people that I can challenge and I will absolutely do that because I think that's incredible. And again, it just keeps the conversation going. Exactly right, yeah. Well, thank you for all your work you were doing and um, sharing the story.